What's going on, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome. I am the Crypto Crow. I am live today. It is what is the day today? My days have been running together. I've got a lot to cover today. It is Wednesday. Okay, I thought it might be. It's Wednesday. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, I, I'm live on uh, YouTube and Twitter. You can expect me to go live on YouTube and Twitter Twitter simultaneously uh, at least a couple times a week. Um, and uh, yeah, so we're going to cover a lot today. We're going to go over Cardano and Mass. We're going to go over Cardano. We're going to go over some previous market cycle stuff. We're going to go over the Chang hard fork and what does that mean for Cardano and why it's so dramatically important. We're going to go over how Cardano uh, functions in price action historically against the US dollar and against Bitcoin. And we're going to show the charts to, to prove it. Um, we're just going to go over a lot of stuff today. This is probably going to be the only time I go live this week. Uh, and I will try to address some questions and things towards the end as long as my head doesn't feel like it's going to pop. I've learned that I have to slow down sometimes when I go live because every time I go live, my head ends up feeling like a zit that needs to be squeezed. And uh, so I, I have to, and I've learned it's because I don't breathe as much when I'm live. So I have to slow down and uh, and I have to breathe. So let's go ahead and start taking a look at some of the stuff that's going on right now. This is the current market. Uh, obviously, card, or Bitcoin has come back up a bit. It's 61192 It's still down about 12% on the seven-day. Um, Ethereum is, is about 3000 Come, It's come down about 14% over the week. And uh, we just continue going down. Solana has been not doing very well. Uh, <clears throat> currently trading at $133.65. And Cardano, obviously, has been going down. Uh, currently trading at oh just upticked to about 40 it's it's averaging about 45 cents um pretty much everything in the market is down now what i want to point out and what i think is really funny is i'll see people on twitter and everybody loves to try and point out individual cryptocurrencies and mock them for being down in the market and then you know and and it's almost like they try to perpetuate these bs narratives about like oh your your coin's not uh, good because it's the it's you look at the price right now it, the entire market is down okay it's a red sea in the market but this isn't anything new I I feel like generally it's a lot of the newcomers that really don't know what they're talking about that have the most to say uh, as it relates to price and so if you want to if you want to know who's new in crypto look for the people that are trash talking a particular coin. And and mocking it for its price being down lately. That that then you know you're talking to somebody that really doesn't know what they're talking about. And I, and I mean that wholeheartedly. I think it's just uh, either that or it's somebody that does know better, but they're trying to use the ignorance of others to try and you know perpetuate some sort of garbage narrative. Um, so the whole market's down, and I've been getting questions recently about, well, what if the wars? Well, how are the wars going to affect the price? How are the wars going to change things, right? And so we're going to dive into some of that because we've had something, not necessarily a war, but it was kind of a war on the on society as a whole. And we're going to show what happened to the price of the markets as that as it related to that uh, that war. First, we're going to check this out. The beauty of Cardano. This is one block, eight transactions to over sixteen hundred unique recipients. Total fees. 5.16 ADA, or at the time, $2.38, so $2.38. Look at all of this happening in eight transactions. This is a hell of a ghost chain, folks. I tell you right now, this vaporware does more than I think I've seen any other blockchain do, uh, and it does it without shutting down. You know, Cardano has never shut down in over like 2,300 days since its launch. It's funny how superior technology can pull stuff like this off, uh, and yet there are still people that love to try and push these these false na narrative natives that, or narratives uh, as it relates to these things. Um, listen, we're going to learn a lot today, and we're going to show you how not only is Cardano ahead of the pack in just about every way uh, and what that means ultimately for its price, because let's be real about it. You know, here, here's something that I want to explain to people. Because you can get in debates and arguments and conversations with people about the technology of blockchain. But, you know, and people will say, but I thought you cared about the tech or, or, or rather if you speak about the price too much. 
And then you start to look like uh, a greed monger of some kind. You start to look like somebody who's just really greedy and you're just all out for, I'm only in it because the price go up. And let's be real about it. This is a very significant disruption of, of an era, of a financial era. And I think it was induced, honestly, I think that the entire thing was induced by um, the government to some degree. I mean, while so many of the players in government and regulation and so forth pretend that they just don't understand or they haven't been able to catch up or whatever, I actually, and maybe that is true to some extent, but I do believe that there are handfuls of people that ultimately ushered in this technology. I don't think it was the work of some invisible man somewhere in the world who happened to hold a million of, the, of his token in a wallet somewhere and decided to launch a truly globally redefining financial technology. Okay. I, I don't think that was without the help of, of powers that be, I don't think this was just like an organic growth by some anonymous person who just happened to be a cyberpunk and decided to change the world. No, I I've always said, and I've done videos years ago about how I thought, um, there were government agencies involved in the inception of Bitcoin. And, and they tried before it. They tried like 10 years before Bitcoin. And there were a lot of issues and backdoors and things that were discovered that ultimately shut the entire thing down. And then lo and behold, 10 years later, there's something new called Bitcoin. And it's on a, a much bigger algorithm. And it's it's at a SHA-256 algorithm. And it's got um, you know all these bells and whistles. And it's going to take over the world. And certainly it is. Now, how does a lot of this stuff play into uh, the market? Now, I can, you know what, I think I'm before I dive into the charts and comparisons and things, I'm going to show you um, kind of what's happening on Cardano first, okay? Because I think this is very relevant to the now, and I think it's going to be a big deal that I, that I explain a lot of this to you. So the Chang hard fork is coming, and it's likely going to be coming in um in in the second quarter of this year which is perfect timing right because we're we're closing in on the having now with just days to go and bitcoin's bitcoin's having is going to take place and basically the amount of bitcoin that's able to be mined up algorithmically is going to be cut in half that ultimately slows down the supply drives up the demand and starts pushing this next bull market forward in significant ways and the Chang hard fork, I'm going to read a bunch of stuff because I want to, I want to make sure I get the wording proper, but um, the Chang hard fork is a significant element as it relates to Voltaire, which is the fourth and final phase of Cardano's overall development. Now, it's always going to be worked on and perfected and bettered over time, I'm sure forever. But there are, there are these major, you know, from Basho to Shelley and so forth, all of these major uh, milestones on the Cardano roadmap, you know, prior to 2021, we didn't have much. We had Basho, which was basically like the bare bones blockchain and a kind of a busted Daedalus wallet that a lot of people had issues with syncing and, and all kinds of stuff. We didn't have any of the stuff we have now. I don't think we had Eternal wallet. I don't think we had NAMI wallet. We definitely didn't have the Lace wallet. We didn't have any of the stuff now. We didn't have DeFi. We didn't have uh, we didn't have NFTs. We didn't have meme tokens. We didn't even have native assets. We didn't have anything, okay, at the peak of 2021. And Cardano still rose to $3 from two cents, okay? Now, as we zero in further on the peak of this market, which I think is going to be truly life-changing for many, many, many people, um, and I don't mean just because of the Bitcoin ETFs. That's going to play a role, and I'm going to express some of that when I get to the charts. But ultimately, this is going to be a life-changing situation for many. And I do believe that Cardano is going to substantially gain steam as we continue to move through 2024. And the reasons why are going to be uh, supported by what I'm about to read and share with you. So the Chang hard fork anticipated to take place in the second quarter represents a huge step towards decentralization and community-run governance within the ADA ecosystem. This upgrade will enable ADA holders to actively participate in shaping the network's future, marking a significant evolution in blockchain governance. Chang aims to introduce a framework for on-chain community consensus, laying the groundwork for a more democratic and participatory governance model. This includes the introduction of delegate representatives, a Cardano Constitution Convention, and a pivotal community vote on the Cardano Constitution. 
setting the stage for a fully decentralized governance mechanism. Now, many of you are going to hear this. You're going to you're going to read that. You've seen it. You're hearing it now, and you're thinking, "What does that matter? What does that mean, Crow? I don't I don't get it." Right. But effectively, what this means is, and I and I see so many conversations all over the place about Cardano and Charles Hoskinson. I just had this recent conversation with Gary Cardone, and he he's like, "Well, what happens if Car- if if Charles were gone?" Right. That was the question: Is how decentralized can something be if it has a leader? Well, by the time a lot of the by the time this Chang hard fork is instituted and implemented into its into the blockchain. We effectively won't really need any of those people anymore. And and we won't need Charles necessarily to dictate a lot of these things. Why? Because the community will be taking over and doing it for him. As an example right now, and you guys probably saw my interview with Charles where we discussed Project Catalyst, right? It's a, it's a very, very powerful system by which the community can vote on which individual projects can, can establish funding uh, from Cardano, but there are holes, there are issues. It can be kind of uh, played a bit. And Charles basically said that at the launch of Chang Hard Fork, that's going to be replaced, and it's going to be replaced with a new system. And all of the functionality of these systems are ultimately going to be voted for and and basically put into place within the Cardano Constitution. That's going to dictate what gets changed, how, what, when, why, and so forth. Ultimately, the leadership of the blockchain is going to be the community itself. What other blockchain do you know of? Let me know in the comments because I don't think any exist. What other blockchains do you know of where the community actually votes for anything other than a hard fork? And by that, the community is generally just the community of miners that are able to dictate those decisions. In this case with Cardano, the holding community is who are going to dictate all changes to the blockchain. And, and moreover, if Cardano has over a billion and a half dollars in treasury, so many people comment on Cardano's marketing. Oh, Cardano doesn't do any marketing. I know they've never done any marketing. They've never paid me a dime to date. Since 2017 in my first Cardano video, I have never received a damn thing from Cardano, no matter what. Not a, oh, thank you so much for your support over the years. Here's some ADA. We really appreciate you. They've never done anything. And I'm not expecting that. I'm not complaining either. What I'm saying is, is that people often complain that Cardano doesn't, they don't do a bunch of paid advertising trying to pump up the token price with a bunch of bullshit and false narratives. Everything Cardano does is built and designed around what it's built and designed to do. And that is what a stat has established such a strong community because they're leading by example and they're leading by true decentralized nature compared to other projects on the blockchain or in cyberspace, if you will, who are basically creating tokens that are VC funded, ultimately controlled. Ownership is in the hands of very few, where a, a much less smaller portion is available on exchanges, DeFi, CEX, and so forth. For the, for the community to play with, but it's ultimately dictated by the hands that control it. And they're paying for these paid narratives, paid articles on, oh, our, car, our coin is so amazing and it's going to pump and you better get your hands on it. A lot of these articles that I read, quite frankly, have got to be illegal to some extent. But they continue and they, per, they, they persist in pushing these narratives that get people that don't know any better to buy into the asset. Time for a quick breath. I can't help but be passionate and excited about it, but it's to a detriment. Now, and and so we don't see any of that stuff with Cardano. But the beauty is, is that very soon, Cardano community, Cardano's ADA holders are going to dictate what marketing starts to happen. Just like Charles said, if somebody wants to submit a proposal where we want to promote on the UFC and get on the mat, Well, they can put up the proposal and the community can vote on whether or not that'd be beneficial. Personally, I think something like that is a waste. Of course, I'm a fight fan and, and, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe not, but it's like, anytime I see the V chain logo on, on the UFC fight mat, I think that's kind of pointless. It doesn't really tell fight fans anything. um, And it doesn't really mean anything to non-crypto related people. They just see a weird word V chain. And I highly doubt the majority of those people are going to run to Google and start looking things up and start educating themselves on blockchain on a whim. 
you have to have a bigger reason. So I believe, and when I'm when my community vote starts taking effect with the Chang hard fork and everything, we're going to go a little deeper because there's more to this. This is just one singular element to what I think is fundamentally sound and very, very powerful and what's coming to the Cardano blockchain here in 2024, likely in the second quarter. But I believe that we need to start focusing more on promoting successful and, and promising use cases on the Cardano blockchain. Cardano should never ultimately be in, 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 the, in the conversation, if, if that makes sense. In other words, when significant use cases come to play, uh, on Cardano, it's not going to be, it's almost like, um, it's like if I plug in my TV into a wall outlet, I don't necessarily need to know the name of the power company that's producing the energy to run my TV. I just care about the TV. What are its pixels like? What's the resolution like? How? What's the audio like? I don't care necessarily what's powering it. And I, and I probably don't care very much about the circuitry behind that screen. What I care is what I'm getting from it. And that is the nature of, of blockchain technology. So many of us that are cyberpunks or whatever you want to call us that have been in this space, whether it was in 2017, 2020, or even all the way back in 2010, 11, and so on, we are more involved in the technology because the true technology and the, the, the technology that makes up these new avenues for uh, DeFi and, and, and basically all of the different application use cases that are coming about it's the technology that drives our interest because we like to know what makes things work. We understand a lot of this stuff. The general public focuses on number go up. And as influencers, educators, whatever you want to call us, we're trying to bridge the gap between the, the, the folks of number go up and the people that understand and want to better understand the technology behind a blockchain. And that is ultimately what establishes the community where everybody's learning from each other. And that is also why Cardano has one of the biggest communities in all of crypto, because we've br we're bringing two worlds together to educate each other and to fuel off of one each other, one another. And, and that is what is so significant. And it won't be long until all of us collectively are going to be able to dictate how the blockchain is used, how it's marketed, where funds are going, and we're actually going to have power within a system. And that is something that we don't see very much of nowadays, do we? I mean, in a system today where we don't know what boat counts, what boat doesn't, where this came from or where that came from, we don't really seem to know anything. And it feels almost as if we have the wool pulled over our eyes. And here we are on the verge of, of basically what I believe to be redefining technology in the space of blockchain that's ultimately going to set a new standard for everything else that exists. And it won't be long until Cardano is pushed so far above and beyond all of the naysayers, all of the other blockchains that are struggling to be viable and consistent, all of these other blockchains that are basically, more often than not, a bunch of shit thrown to a wall to see what sticks as they continue trying to repair itself and continue trying to keep up with these narratives that they try to project themselves through paid advertisement. And there's going to be a day, and I don't think it's going to be too long from now, when Cardano so dramatically rises above the rest that there will no longer be a question. And some of the things that I'm talking about here are going to express exactly that, because these are technologies that other blockchains have, but they do it poorly. And what do we know is different about Cardano as it compares to everything else? It's done right the first time. So many of these applications and blockchains out there, they, they can be first to market with a new idea or a new concept to address issues, but they don't really mean anything if they aren't changing the way the blockchains work and it doesn't change the overall user experience. Your blockchain is trash if it shuts down randomly. I'm sorry, I don't care about the narrative and I don't even care to call names. Your blockchain is trash if you spend every waking year of every cycle trying to fix what you did the previous cycle and constantly trying to perpetuate this notion that you're going to get it right this time and it never seems to happen or change anything. These narratives are going to get consistently older and more draining and more frustrating to the people who are getting used to seeing Cardano do things right 
the first time. And it's no longer going to matter as much. And I really do believe that this market cycle is going to be the one that truly educates everybody on how blockchain should work. And then in that, I mean, this is going to be the one that basically tells everybody it doesn't matter if a blockchain takes longer to launch a particular milestone or meet a new metric. What matters is that it's done properly and it can be relied on from then on without having to work backwards. That is, I believe, what the narrative is going to continue building the community within Cardano and pulling people from other networks, other blockchains. So we're going to go a little bit deeper and we're going to take a look at some more of this stuff. Now, it really is hard not to get worked up. I, I damn near get emotional anytime I start going on, on stuff like this. Now, a part of this Chang hard fork is Plutus version three, and it's a massive upgrade that will bring new possibilities for applications built on Cardano. For example, it introduces new cryptographic primitives, including zero knowledge. Okay, this is where we talk. This will allow building of ZK rollups and ZK smart contracts on Cardano. This is big, folks, because we already have, and this is why I showed this first, like I showed this. Okay, now, this is what Cardano is capable of doing right now. I don't know. Let me know in the comments below what other blockchains out there can do this. This is, I don't even remember, somebody calculated this up, um, about 80 transactions per second right now. Um, and and that's not even a big deal. Now, imagine 80, tra let's just say it were 80 transactions per second, okay? Now, let's just say that ZK rollups and ZK smart contracts add a whole new paradigm to these transactions all right and you're going to understand in a minute plutus language contains built-in functions that are commonly used in scripts v3 brings in new functions for example 17 new primitives that support cryptographic curves it opens doors to seamless sidechain implementation and integration with mithril furthermore a cryptographic hash function kick hack 256 which produces a 256-bit hash value. It is commonly used for secure data verification on Ethereum, okay? So supporting it in Plutus will allow for building cross-chain solutions and support community projects. Cross-chain solutions, basically functional on Cardano, functional on Ethereum, functional on other blockchains. Now, what are some of the what do some of these terms mean? Rollups process transaction on another faster blockchain known as a layer two, then port that transaction back to the parent blockchain, the layer one or mainnet, at a fraction of the price. This means that users can benefit from the speed and cheapness of the rollup while also benefiting from the security of the bigger blockchain. Rollups are one of several scaling systems which are simply methods to make a slow blockchain faster and cheaper. Other scaling systems include side chains and state channels. Now, bear in mind that when they're referencing slow blockchains, this article was basically written to describe ZK rollups as it relates to Ethereum. Now, I don't necessarily think Ethereum's that slow. I just did a few transactions today. They were pretty quick. Um, they, they were, I think each one cost a few bucks, all right, in Ethereum to do. That's okay. Now, ZK rollups. The second kind of rollup is zero knowledge rollup, also known as a ZK rollup, which are being introduced to Cardano in the Chang hard fork. These protocols use a complex piece of cryptography, cryptography called a zero knowledge proof to determine that a transaction is valid using only minimal information about that transaction. It's privacy preserving, sleek, and most important, fast and cheap. Compared with an optimistic rollup, which requires funds to stay on the network until the dispute resolution period has closed, ZK rollups allow users to withdraw their funds with less of a delay. ZK rollups hold a number of advantages over optimistic rollups in terms of speed and security, but they are considerably more complex under the hood. Okay. And there's plenty of articles out there. I, I encourage everyone to go and look up. What are some <clears throat> look up some of the, the 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 releases and the information related to Cardano's Chang hard fork? This is it. 
Chang hard for, and I didn't even realize fully what a big deal it is. Okay. I've been diving deeper. I'm going to be doing more videos on, I'm going to be talking about mithril. I'm going to be talking about a lot of the things. And here's one of the problems is because I listen to Charles all the time and the way he rattles off information as though it's second nature we miss a lot of the important nuggets within what Charles says on a regular basis. A lot of it goes right over our heads and we just don't understand. And because of that, I feel like we need more of us out there really breaking down the technologies that are being brought to the Cardano blockchain and not just what those technologies are, but how they could be effectively utilized by applications what kinds of applications could these different um you know these variable metrics and these new ideas these concepts these systems what can they do for the end user and i think that that is definitely going to be a big focus as i move forward in my cardano journey and and i think that it's it's a very 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 big deal because i don't think the majority of people out there truly understand the technology by card behind cardano and why it's so dramatically important you know, you could put a Ferrari, I'll give you the perfect example of kind of what I'm talking about here. Back in the day, I used to have my, one of my first cars was a, well, my very first car was a 1984 Oldsmobile Cutlass Supreme. I think my second car was a 1985 Cutlass Supreme Brogham with a 350 rocket engine in it. Okay. Now sounds great. And at the time when you're young and dumb and you just want to go fast, that car went fast as lightning. I had to learn how to drive that car without spinning its wheels by accident. It was so powerful. This engine would make, I would gently push the gas and my tires would just spin. I could go from zero to 80 in like no time flat in this car. But what was the problem? The problem was is that the engine was ultimately a Franken engine. It was a 350 rocket, but it was built by, it was built with like Buick parts and Oldsmobile parts and like, Chevy, all kind. It was basically a Franken engine. So while I could easily put out a paid narrative that basically says I just improved the Oldsmobile speed by eighty percent at zero to sixty in so many seconds, and I did all of these great things, what that article wouldn't tell you is that it was a Franken engine full of broken bits and pieces that would break down constantly every week. Because all I really wanted to do is be able to provide you a re realistic message that I can go fast, and that's all anybody would care about. And then maybe every Everybody would run out and buy one of those cars so that they could go fast with their Franken engines while it broke down and cost them about, I don't know, four times uh, what I paid for it in repair fees every time I was left on the highway. And that's a very good analogy that's not only my real life when I was a teenager, but it's basically how I see a lot of these blockchains today being developed and marketed. They don't tell you that they're Franken engines that aren't going to get you very far, but you can get a little bit of somewhere really damn fast. And they try to perpetuate these narratives focusing on things like TPS, transactions per second, that really, in a nutshell, we're learning doesn't really mean very much if the network doesn't work or shuts down randomly or you can't get in and out of positions because the network's constantly shutting down or the transfer fees are so dramatically high that it can cost you 10 times in fees what it, what you're trying to actually send to your neighbor for a good, good job on the yard work, okay? So that's kind of what I'm talking about here. And so there's so much misconception, misunderstanding, and I think it's time so many of us really start putting a lot of this bullshit to rest and calling these people out, calling these comments out i think it's really up to the community of cardano to really not start attacking people that make these comments but educating the readers of these comments with real facts and real information don't engage the trolls in a back and forth because that doesn't matter more often than not these people know what they're saying and why and generally it's just to protect their own investments and their own bags what we need to do is educate these people with real information and show them why they're wrong, whether they know it or not, and give them an opportunity to get out and join us. And I think that is ultimately the narrative that needs to be perpetuated in crypto, a sense of unity, a sense of education, and sharing real-world information. And that's exactly where I think we need to be. Now, this is big. Don't go anywhere because I'm going to be showing you some charts next that I think are going to matter to you. And it's, this, is, this segment is especially going to be important to a lot of my friends and people who are blowing me up all the dag on time because they're worried. What's happening? What's happening, Crow? Um, now, 
I am going to share my chart here in a minute. And at first, it's going to look a little messy until I zoom in. But here we go. Now, this, ladies and gentlemen, uh, is Bitcoin against the US dollar on a weekly logarithmic a chart. All right. Now, if I, let me see, what can I hide here? Can I hide drawings? All right. We're going to hide the drawings here for a minute. This is Bitcoin's chart since inception. All right. All the way down here on the left, which you can't see because my big old face is in the way. But this is Bitcoin back in 2009. This here is the one of the first peaks in 2011. All right. This here is December of 2013. We're just touching on the red here for the first time. This here is December of 2017, Bitcoin's peak. I got into crypto about, uh, I got into crypto around right here. I got in, I first got started in crypto around August. Okay. And I know it's hard for you to see because it's still zoomed out quite a bit. Uh, I wonder if I can make that a little bigger. Yeah, I could do that. All right. So I, I first got into crypto, but I didn't start um, my YouTube channel until I think it was like November 7th or November 17th or something like that. Now, this was the, the, the peak in 2017. We came down, we, we basically rinsed and repeated, and then we came up even higher for a new all-time high. Uh, and the first peak was, uh, you know, I called that in April. It was April 13th of 2021. And as I said, you know, we're looking at a, set, a two market peak and sure enough, it was. I've already explained a million times how I was able to figure that out. And then here we are now. So we're gonna zoom in a bit, okay? And we're going to show what's happening. Now, this is Bitcoin. I've got a Cardano chart, chart here too I'm going to show you because I, I think people are getting a little concerned. And I'm like, you know what? There's nothing to really be concerned about. Many of us have seen this many, many times. Here, this is back in 2016, before the 2017 peak. Here's the halving, okay? We went and we dropped 42% from the local peak to the bottom, and these are wicks, okay? I went ahead and I counted the wicks. Generally, the wicks happened within a day, all right? So if you're looking at Bitcoin's price, if you're chasing the wicks, you go wick to wick, there, there's the total price. Um, typically, the wicks are market makers on exchanges that are basically doing what they need to to either pump or dump the market to liquidate uh, shorts and longs and so forth, which I'm not even sure if we had those yet back then, but um, there were definitely market makers at play. So if we were to get rid of the wick and come down, we still had like a 28% drop uh, that basically started before the halving and concluded after the halving, all right? And each one of these candles is a week. So you're looking at basically a period of like two months right in this area before what? before we ran up into the $20,000 peak. When this was going on, Bitcoin was $642, folks. We went from a bottom here of $565 all the way up to $20,000. That was just that peak. We were in the red, all right? We were at the top of this logarithmic scale. There was a very, very powerful statement because it was the first time we reached it. Then, of course, we dropped about 80%. This started the narrative where if you ask anyone around this time frame here, what do you think of Bitcoin? All they knew to tell you, isn't that that, that digital money that ran all the way up to $20,000 and dropped down 80%? What a scam. That's what we heard. Okay. But what they didn't tell you is, or what they don't know is that from that point, let's say from the bottom to the peak, it rose 4,309%. So it rose 4,309% to basically drop from peak to bottom 84%. These are the narratives that the ignorance, and I don't mean ignorance in the sense of they're stupid, but ignorance in the sense that they're not educated on the cycles or the systems. So it's easy to look at this and think, oh my gosh, what a scam. Everybody lost and people were selling at a loss and nobody understood what was happening. Well, those of us who got in around here, many of us that got started in 2017 didn't know either. 
Okay. Many of us didn't really start to catch on until around Bitcoin's $8,000 mark at the height of 20 grand. And we thought, okay, this isn't going back up anymore. Even though we had a whole lot of narratives out there pushing, how far can we go? Will we get a pullback? Will we see 25,000? Will we see 30,000? What was that doing? That was maintaining exit liquidity for those in the know. That's what that was doing. Because those articles, those narratives that were being perpetuated all over that time, those were articles that people that were in the know and were getting out needed to keep the price from dropping even faster. They wanted people buying in while they were exiting, hence exit liquidity. Now, we bottomed out. We made a rise back up into the blue came back down. Why did we crash so hard around this area here? Well, that was when COVID was announced. COVID was announced right around this week here. We continued to move up because that was the trend, but then it broke and it went all the way down here. We dropped 62%, folks. 62% is what we dropped right before the next halving. This was the 2020 halving, all right? What happened after that? Well, we headed into our two-peak cycle where basically Bitcoin effectively went, well, let's see. This isn't from the bottom. Technically, from the bottom, Bitcoin went, uh, it basically rose up 1,682% in this cycle. Now, keep in mind, people say it's diminishing returns, but it's really not. Because if you think about it, it's a lot easier to move up percentages. This is from a low of about $4,000. The original low was 580 bucks. So it's not necessarily diminishing returns. It's just that we're starting a cycle and we're starting a run from a much higher dollar amount. So for us to go from $4,000 to $64,000, that's a six, almost 1,700% gain. The first peak of that cycle was around 65 grand. The second peak um, that was around November of 2021 was $69,000. Where are we now? So this is all happening. When I said that, what is the what is the war? I get all these questions. What do we think that the war is going to do? How is the war going to affect crypto, Bitcoin, Cardano, everything, with everything going on? Well, this all happened in the midst of the COVID war. That was a war on society. That was a war on illness. That was a war on so many different things happening at once that was effectively tearing the very fabric of society apart. And we still had a two-peak cycle where we rose up from 4,000 to a high of 69,000 before we came back down. COVID ended here in April of 2023. It was officially announced it's no longer an emergency. And away we started to move back up. And we've pretty effectively been moving back up since, with the exception of this little period here of a couple months uh, in September and October of 2023, where we had a lull in the market. Well, moving into this cycle here, which we're moving in and we're closing in on this new uh, halving, what do we see? Well, right around here, we had ETF official announcement approvals. All right. This is where Bitcoin's ETFs were approved, and look what happened. Boom. The very first time in Bitcoin's history where we had a new all-time high before the halving. The price action of this point right here, we could take it from a low to the peak. That's an 89 and almost a 90% improvement from the time that the Bitcoin ETFs were approved and where they are right now. We're getting a little bit of a pullback. My balls are not sweaty, folks. I don't know what else to say other than don't worry, be happy. If anything, this is an opportunity for people to average in that don't feel confident in their overall positions yet. This is not a, a position for me to start freaking out. Now, what if, I mean, so from, the, from this here, so we went up 90%. Why did we go up 90%? And I'm not done with the charts, but I want to point something out here. Why did we go up 90%? We went up 90% because even though we had grayscale dumping hundreds of millions of dollars worth of Bitcoin onto the market um, because of the new spot Bitcoin ETFs that had significantly lower fees, People are buying up these other ETFs, which is causing them to go out on the market, buy Bitcoin at market price or spot price while Grayscale was dumping. 
So there was an exchange going on that was there was a higher demand for Bitcoin at the time with these ETFs than there was dumping, but there was significant dumping. We could have effectively already been in the red of this logarithmic scale if Grayscale's fees weren't so high and they weren't having to dump into the market. Because then all of these ETFs that with this growing demand and Fidelity and, and Vanek and all these guys buying up all of the spot Bitcoin they can – based off of the demand of their customers, okay, which they weren't even really marketing it yet. I'm just now starting to see that they're advertising these new vehicles, okay, as we head into the halving, This is going to be substantial. Now, we've already hit a new all-time high. This is the first time in history since we've hit an all-time high uh, before a halving. Well, what does that mean? So people are freaking out and they're thinking, oh my gosh, what's going to happen now? Because the prices are dropping down a little bit. Listen, folks, we've dropped 20%. That is standard. That is standard. That's a part of the game. That is a start. That's a part of the cycle. And we've seen much more significant drops in previous cycles than 20%. And that, and on top of that, we've seen much more dramatic drops of 20%. Not, not even after a new all-time high has been made. Because if you look at previous cycles here, you can see a lot of this stuff is way, way in the green still. We haven't even moved out of the blue. And here we are sideways, sideways for months. I'm not saying we can't be sideways now. Now, let's take a look at some other details here. This, this first, uh, this is to the day. Okay, roughly about to the day. This is how Cardano performed in the last cycle. To, and, and, and basically from um, April of 2018 to current day, you can see it emulates pretty fairly what's been happening uh, with Bitcoin. You can see the ebbs and flows, the trenches and the peaks and all of that. That's not even that important. The point to that is that ultimately Cardano and most in the top of the market capitalization of crypto typically moves um, foot, you know, lockstep with Bitcoin, but to different degrees. By, by what different degrees? Well, this degree. This is what's different. This is Cardano against Bitcoin from 2017 to present day. What do you see here? When Bitcoin peaks... Okay, so this was a peak here. What happened? These are weekly candles. One, two, three, four, five. Five weeks, roughly five weeks after the, after the first peak of Bitcoin. When it started to drop, what happened? Cardano started to peak up. Okay, and I can guarantee you, if you look at Cardano's growth over Bitcoin in the last market cycle, it's thousands of percentage higher than Bitcoin. Then we had the second peak. Okay. We had second peak here, but before that Cardano had its major peak against Bitcoin. All right. And, and if you were to just chart and it's hard to do on a bars pattern chart, but I think this is like a 4,000% gain over. Let me, let me look at it. And I, these numbers aren't exact. I th I'm hoping that this is yeah, these aren't that. This is showing a 15, 1600% gain over uh, Bitcoin. I'm, I'm pretty sure it was a little higher than that, uh, but you get the idea. The point is, is that people are often worried and they say, well, Bitcoin has gone up by 20%. Cardano hasn't moved. No, Cardano generally does what it's going to do. Now, before I get to Cardano's chart and show things off a little bit better, this is where I think we're heading. All right. So we've got the having. And then I'm guessing sometime around February of 2025 is likely where we might be. We may very well be looking for a peak at somewhere around $175,000. Now, some of this is going to be dictated by ETFs. It's going to be dictated by others because we may very well. I talked to Gary Cardone and, and he's like, we're not going to have a Cardano ETF. We're not going to have a Cardano ETF. And I'm thinking to myself, we may not have a Cardano ETF in the United States, but that's not to say that we won't have them in Asia. That's not to say that we won't have them in other countries because it's other countries have launched Bitcoin ETFs. I'm pretty sure prior to prior to the United States. So I'm not necessarily worried about, nor do I even necessarily know I want there to be institutional ETFs in Cardano, quite frankly. I don't want them garnering more control over the blockchain, and I definitely don't want there to be somebody like BlackRock or, or any of these major whale institutions 
being able to accumulate billions and billions of dollars, or for that matter, billions of ADA, and being able to help and, and kind of play a role in dictating what goes on in the Cardano blockchain. I want Cardano to remain the will of the people and its holders, not the institutions that might want to change the game. However, the flip side to that is, and this is this is more of a, in my opinion, kind of an ethical dilemma. Do you want an institution like BlackRock to launch a Cardano ETF, accumulate billions of ADA, and have one of the biggest voices in its consensus algorithm or in its democracy, this, this transparent democracy state of Cardano where the users are dictating where funds and capital and marketing and everything else is going? just because it might make the number go up substantially? Or is it one of those questions where you're only in it for the money, bring in these major institutions to go ahead and pump up the bag so that I can sell, walk away from it rich and happy, fat and sassy, and you know, let my kids deal with what may be the outcome of what I believe is going to be one of the most utilized blockchains in the world over the next decade? you know, and, and beyond. So that that's kind of the moral or ethical dilemma that I see. You have to ask yourself that question, especially as I see in the comments, people talking about, you know, CBDCs and technology like that. So if, if we're looking at this chart here, this is not Cardano folks against the dollar. This is Cardano against Bitcoin. Let this sink in. This is Cardano against Bitcoin, and you can see it has it has its dumps, it has its peaks and valleys, just like everything else. But this was uh, the halving of 2020, where it rose up quite a bit after Bitcoin, or um, it rose up quite a bit against Bitcoin's value, came back down, bottomed out again before run number one came down for a correction, sideways. Run number two came down, sideways, correction. Run number three into the peak. Now, this is dramatic. That was okay. So that was 1,000%. Overall, from bottom to peak, uh, that was 1,000% gain over Bitcoin's value, folks. So, and keep this in mind, as Cardano's rising, or as Bitcoin's rising, rather, from like, $4,000 $4,000 to $64,000, Cardano, even though it has its peaks and valleys throughout the bull run, Cardano basically blew Bitcoin's value away by a 1,000% last cycle. And that was before we had smart contracts. That was before we had meme tokens. That was before we had NFTs. That was before we had basically anything on chain yet. Put that into perspective with what's been happening since 2021 on the Cardano blockchain. And then you tell me that Cardano is having trouble. It hasn't, it's not having trouble, folks. Look at this. Look at this. If this were the market today, look at the sideways activity from 2019 all the way to 2020. It was sideways against Bitcoin. It doesn't mean that the price wasn't moving. The price was moving. The price was going up and down like it always does. This is just as it relates to Bitcoin. And keep in mind that Bitcoin is going up as these things are happening. So these ebbs and flows, these peaks and valleys are against Bitcoin's price moving up and down with the market itself against the US dollar. This is Cardano moving up against Bitcoin. Now, I ask you, what do you think is going to happen next? Given everything that you've seen today, let me know in the comments below what you think is happening next. Does Cardano get back to just $3? Does Cardano just get back to where it was at the peak of the last cycle before we had anything on chain? Does Cardano just maybe get to five bucks? Um, you know, you tell me. I, I, I don't know. I, I'm asking you, where do you think Cardano goes in this part in this cycle with everything that's booming? One of the most one of the most developed blockchains in existence, number one on pretty much every chart as it, ter- as it relates to development. Um, number one, I'm pretty positive on every decentralization chart out there, which I showed yesterday. Um, you know, what is it that you think everyone else out there is so afraid of if they're always saying Cardano's dead, Cardano's vaporware, Cardano's a ghost chain, Cardano's this, Cardano's that? I laugh in the faces of those that doubt what's being developed 
and what's coming right around the corner. And come the second quarter of 2024, I think that's going to be the knockout punch in a lot of ways, especially given the fact that in the meantime, we're going to continue building on Hydra. We're going to continue building upon all of the fundamental frameworks that ultimately make up Cardano's roadmap until we get to the point where I believe it's going to be one of the most utilized blockchains out there, hands down. And, um, you know, I think there's going to come a point where the idea that Cardano is being developed with interoperability and cross-chain at mind, I think a lot of these other blockchains out there that have been one of its biggest rivals are ultimately going to be one of its biggest supporters. Why? Because they're going to want to take advantage of what Cardano has built once Cardano has officially won that race. And they're going to say, okay, let's work together. Because if we don't work together, we're just going to fall by the wayside into irrelevancy as Cardano continues to rise to the top. And those that miss the boat are just going to be clamoring after trying to find that next big thing at two cents that they missed out on because they were so stubbornly and adamantly trying to follow people that just didn't have their best interest in mind, trying to pump their bags at their expense. And we see so much of that today. I'm a huge bag holder of Cardano, but I'm a bag holder of Cardano because I absolutely believe in what's being developed. And I believe and I see with my own two eyes because I look and I observe and I watch and I study and I research and I put in the work at my own research to understand the value proposition to what's being developed. That's why I'm a bag holder, not because... uh, some VC wrote an article and paid a you know a couple thousand dollars or a couple million dollars to have some bullshit narrative perpetuated all over my favorite news sites, and I just thought it sounded good, so I bought more. That's just not how I roll because I don't really give a shit about any of that. But anyway, that's it for today. Hopefully, I've painted a picture for you guys that actually matters and means something. Hopefully, you share this video, you like it. Um, drop your comments, help the algorithm. Make sure you subscribe if you haven't already, because I'm trying to break 150,000. After as long as I've been on YouTube, you'd think at least this old guy with a whitening beard, uh, who's all, all ultimately whitening probably because of crypto, let's be honest. Um, you know, uh, maybe I, I would think I'd merit at least 150,000 subs. Do you think? I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. Until next time, guys and gals, thanks for joining me so much. Until then, until next time, crow your coins, and I'll see you soon.